Welcome, everyone. I'm Sue Barber, author, former IT director for a Fortune 500 company, turned executive coach, and this is the Visibility Factor Podcast, where we explore how to raise your visibility and play bigger at work and in life. We'll explore key topics and welcome guests that help you shift your thinking about yourself so you can see new possibilities for your leadership. I'm on a mission to create a visibility movement for leaders to show their value and be seen for their true talent. Are you ready to take the next step towards a higher level of visibility for yourself? Let's go. Hello, everyone. It's Sue Barber. Welcome back to the Visibility Factor podcast. I am so excited today to have Becky Morrison join me. I want to read a quick bio about her, and then we're going to get into some great conversation. Even though Rebecca Morrison was a happily married mom and lawyer with a two-decade career in big law and finance, she felt something was missing. That feeling led her on a quest to figure out whether it was possible to be both successful and happy. Now a happiness coach and author of The Happiness Recipe, A Powerful Guide Living for What Matters, Rebecca helps successful but unsatisfied high achievers find their happiness recipe so they can live happier, lead happier, and build happy businesses. Rebecca is a graduate of Wellesley College and Georgetown Law. She is also a UC Berkeley Executive Coaching Institute Certified Executive Coach. Welcome to the show, Becky. So happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here, Sue. Oh, I'm excited to have this conversation. So I love the title of the book, The Happiness Recipe. So as a as a writer myself and an author, what was it like for you to write the book? And what did you hope that it would do for readers? So um, interestingly, when I, so I joined a writer's retreat in June of 2020 with the notion that I would begin to collect my thoughts and sort of frameworks around coaching that I had thought I would be doing by going out in person and talking with people, but then pandemic, right? (laughs) And so my intention actually in joining that retreat was not to write a book. It was just to have some concentrated time where I could write. And as I started writing, I realized, oh, this is actually sort of a recipe for how how to get from point A to point B. And um, thus the book was born. So I did not... (laughs) Like I say, I accidentally wrote a book sometimes, and that's a little bit, <laughs> little bit of an overstatement, right? Because you know the process. You've written a book. I mean, there's yeah. there's a lot that goes in, not just to the writing, but the post sort of production of a book. Um, once I figured out I was writing a book, obviously a lot of effort and energy went into it. But initially, it was just about again capturing kind of my favorite tools, some of what I had learned over the course of my career and life, and figuring out how to kind of bottle that up and share it with people in a way that was actionable. Well, it's amazing. I I can't wait to have more conversations. I had some questions for you since I just read it and I wanted to really get into it. And I know the people who have not read it yet, I wanted to give you a little bit of an inside scoop into what the book is about so you can see if it's a good fit for you. You had an amazing story at the beginning of the book about your daughter and giving her a bath and what you were doing at the same time, which resonated so much with me as a working mom. So I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing that story and how that that moment was really so pivotal for you. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a moment that happened about 16 years ago. That same um, toddler that was in the tub is graduating from high school (laughs) this weekend. So, um, you know, but I found myself, um, let's call it a Tuesday night, sitting on the floor of the bathroom. And my husband um, was at the time working in counterterrorism and he had been called into work because something had blown up. And so I was on kid duty, but I was also a practicing attorney and we were preparing for an upcoming, and I don't remember if it was deposition or trial, but in the height of preparation. And so I had a call that evening with one of our experts to get them ready um, for their upcoming testimony and found myself with my toddler daughter in the tub and the cordless phone, because this was 16 years ago and we didn't have cell phones or wireless headphones or any fun stuff like that. So cordless phone clipped to the back of my pants, headphones in my ears, toilet seat cover with the notebook on top of the toilet seat cover, papers everywhere. And I'm supervising her in the bath and trying to really actively participate in this conversation with our experts. Sort of as that wrapped up, I had two thoughts in quick succession. The first thought was, who says you can't do it all? Like I'm here, I'm killing it. I'm a you know, I'm having some good success at work. I'm on partnership track. I'm getting good reviews. Like I'm being a good lawyer and I'm here with my daughter and I'm able to put her to bed and I'm able to be a present mom and, and all of those things. And then the second thought was, and I'm exhausted and this might not be sustainable. And actually more than that, I'm not sure that even though I'm good at being a lawyer, even though 
I have the skills to do this, that this is really making me happy, that this is really what I'm meant to do or what I should be prioritizing. So yeah, that's that bathtub moment that I talk about in my book. And I think it's one that resonates with a lot of people because we've all, especially working parents, but not just working parents, have done some version of that sort of trying to keep your fingers in all the holes lest something explode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were many days I was in the car with three kids saying, okay, mommy has to do a conference call right now. You have to be quiet. Yes. You know? so, and they got used to it. I mean, it was, they were wonderful, but it was just, it, it does make you feel guilty. Yes. Right. Because your, your attention is torn in two directions and probably neither one is getting a hundred, obviously not getting a hundred percent of you in any way. Yeah. I think that's ultimately right. And, and, you know, I, I mean, I do have noticed in, in the work that I do with clients now, um, that over the last two years, we have developed, and I say we in like the global sense, have developed a greater tolerance for people's lives being present in the workplace because everybody is all of a sudden, or many people have had to shift their workplace to their home. And so, mm-hmm. you know, an, interrupt, an interruption from a kid or a pet doesn't seem like the big deal that it used to be. I've seen more calls where a kid pops in and waves at everybody and pops out. And and I kind of wonder, like, I I don't know yet. Jury's still out. Is that better? But it certainly feels more, more whole to me because we are whole people who have a lot of different facets to our lives. So, yeah. Yeah. I actually think it's better. And I know um, one of the other people that I coach, you know, her entire team, they've all met each other's pets they know each other's significant others because they're all home all day yes. and they're working remotely. So I think it just brings you together in a different way and helps you see that this person is a human being with a real personal life outside of the, you know, however many hours they're spending together at work. Okay. So I think it's super helpful to, to people to have that. Yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, we are not professionals. We are people mm-hmm. who do jobs and have lives. Mm-hmm. And so to mm-hmm. be able to be the fullest expression of ourselves in all of those places, I think is is a big deal. So you have a term in your book called priority aligned living. Yes. Can you describe what that is? And is that, a, you know, something you made up? Where did it come from? And what does it mean to you? So that I know of, um, I made it up. <laughs> but you know, often, often multiple people have the same thought. So I haven't like trademarked it or anything, but it's this notion that if we can get clear on what is most important to us in this season of our lives and do more of that and less of the rest, that's sort of how we maximize our happiness recipe. So it's about how do we align our ourselves, our beliefs, our actions with those priorities and live in a way that honors that. And I think when we can do that, we really decrease I have a friend who calls it like we take the, the the resistance out of the hustle, the friction out of the hustle. I don't love the word hustle, but the notion is we sort of decrease the opportunities for sort of tension and friction because we're living in a way that's aligned. We're on the track or we're in the river, however you want to think about that flowier place. Mm-hmm. Plus, I think it would help you not be in comparison as much 100%. too because you're focused on the things that are important to you and not anyone else. And we all have different priorities and values that we're aligned with and focused on. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, that's where the notion of or why I picked the idea of recipe, right? It's, you know, what's going to work for your palate, for your experience, for your life? You know, you might make your chocolate chip cookies one way and I might make them another way and they might both be delicious, but we're going to prefer our own chocolate chip cookie, right? <laughs> so why are we hung up on like this particular way is how we have to live in order to be happy? No, the reality is it's infinitely and intimately personal. And so we've got to leave ourselves room to just, as you say, to sort of be in our personal recipe and out, out of that comparison. Mm-hmm. Okay, a quick side note. My sister and I both make cookies the exact same way. But they do not taste the same. But, that, and but we I mean, don't so know like, why. But yes, right. I mean, so like that is true in life yeah. too. Like that's why comparison yes. doesn't work because if we, you know, what I mean, we're gonna get different results because we stir it differently or we mm-hmm. add things in a different order or in a different way. I mean, it just little differences can make a big deal to the outcome. And so it's about finding a way to do it that's aligned with where you're trying to go to maximize the chance that you're going to get what you want at the end, not what somebody else has said you should want. Yeah, I love that. Uh, So you talk about three different types of gaps in the book. Can you describe those? And what what do you want people to think about as they're going through the book with these three different gaps? Should they choose one? Do they go through each of them and really focus on them individually? and then come together at the end. So 
what I did when I when I sat down to write this is I, you know, I had this already this notion of what I call priority aligned living that we are, you know, we've already discussed. And then I thought about, okay, well, what stops us from executing on that? What gets in our way? And that's where I came up with these three gaps. I have kind of longer names for them in the book, but I'll use their short names here. The first gap is the no gap. So it's, do you actually know what matters most to you in this season of your life? Have you actually done the sort of connection to self work to really get clear on what you want? Not again, what you should want, but what you actually want, what matters most to you. And are you clear on where the edges and boundaries are of your current season? Like I might have aspirations of someday living on a beach, but is that a today thing, a current season thing or a long-term, another season thing, right? And how do we sort of get really focused on where we are today and what needs to be our top priority in our current season? So that's the no gap. I'm going to skip the middle gap for a second because what happens in our world is we go right from knowing to doing. And the third gap, I call it the physical energy gap in the book, but it's the doing gap. Yes. Are you actually living acting in a way that is consistent with what you've decided matters most to you in this season. You know, there's a lot in there around sort of building habits, how to work with your nervous system, how to celebrate. Those kinds of things live in the action place. I said I was going to come back to the middle. I think of this as the bridge. And it's the one we don't engage in with intention very often. And I call it the belief gap. It's the mindset gap. Do we have the supportive beliefs and feelings that will allow us to take what we know and do it? Because that requires, for most of us, some element of change. And there's a lot in our programming that says, just fundamental sort of human programming that says change is scary and dangerous, and so please avoid it. And so how do we kind of develop the feelings and beliefs that will pull us through that resistance into taking that action in a sustained way? And so you asked, how do I want people to go through it? I mean, I think if you're really looking and what I do a lot with my clients is look at how do we want to architect your current or next season? And we'll go through the whole process because the reality is that most of us have some amount of gap in each place. That said, I also designed this to be a toolbox that once you sort of are familiar with the tools, you can pull it back out. I will often find myself bumping up against one of the gaps. And I can, you know, I've played with them enough now that I can identify, oh, you know what, it's time to like take a step back and figure out what what's the real priority. Or, um, <laughs> for example, when March 2020 hit, the entire, like it was a whole new season for all of us. So I need to go a little deeper and figure out what is the new priority for this season. Not the old goals that I had, not where I thought I was going, where am I really going, given that the playing field has changed. And so, or, you know, I, I mean, mindset stuff comes up all the time. Anytime I try to, to, to make a change, I have to look at what do I believe about this? What do I believe about being an entrepreneur? What do I believe about operating at the next level? What do I believe about parenting a college student, which I'm uh, on the verge of? And will those beliefs support what I want my life to look like? So, I mean, I think like I'm continuously tuning up all those areas um, and so it's never just one, um, but it doesn't have to be this like deep, intensive, like A to Z process every time. Gotcha. Yeah, I love that. I think it's true also where you talked about uh, the no gap, because I think a lot of people operate in the land of should and, you know, how you grew up, the experiences that your parents had and should you do the same. I think a lot of people, you know, turn into their parents at some point, pick a parent and they become that one, right? Uh, and so I think that's very true. And I also have run into many, many people and until I became a coach, I didn't even probably realize it, but just examining your own thoughts and beliefs and assumptions is a really important thing to slow down and do that. So I love in your book how you you know, designed activities for each one of these gaps. So maybe in, in one place they start and know, and then they move to something else as they kind of master that. But at some point, you're going to come back to it. You do something new, you're going to come back to it again. Yes. <laughs> and it's going to show it's, up. It's not a circle, but it's almost like this, like ever looping infinity symbol or something, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, you just said it, like we live in the shoulds. And to get past the shoulds, we have to get some clarity in the no, but we also have to look at our beliefs. And so mm -hmm. it's like, we're constantly kind of weaving in and out of these gaps. It's not, I mean, I like, a, I love a good linear process. Like I have an operations background before law school. So like, you know, let me have the, the flow chart with the yes or no's, but this doesn't, this doesn't flow exactly that way, right? When in practice, it's a lot of like looping 
back around as new new resistance yeah. comes up it, really is what it is. It happens yeah. a lot. I definitely experienced a lot of that myself. So you have shared a ton of stories in your book that I would say are very vulnerable and very much relatable to me as a working mom. But any working parent, I think, could also relate to some of this. Can you talk about any of those and how they changed you? So I've had the gift of being raised by two parents. Uh, My dad was a Lutheran pastor and my mom was for the bulk of her career. She actually went to law school when I was in preschool kindergarten. So every, for everything after that, um, she worked as an in-house attorney at a very large company. And the thing, the, the, the true gift that I think that they gave me is that they were very intentional about how they lived, which allowed me to bring a level of intentionality to how I live or demonstrated what what happens when you do that, like the benefit of doing that. And I would love to say that I like walked out of the house at 17 when I went to college, like ready to live intentionally. <laughs> you I did would not. be a unique person. <laughs> yes. <you had. laughs> yes. And I have to keep reminding myself, like I said, as I have a high school senior, I'm like, it's OK. It's OK. She's she's like so close to where she needs to be. And I'm I'm super proud of her. But like I also recognize that there's a lot of growing still to happen because I've experienced mm-hmm. it. So, you know, just as an example, like. I told you about that bathtub moment, and I, I, I'd love to say that I woke up in that moment and sort of reallocated my priorities and got clear right, a, right away, but the reality is a number of things happened after that that sort of were like the two by four of like, pay attention, Becky, something needs to change. And when I finally got clear that that season of my life, I really wanted to be a mom first season. And by that, I didn't mean stop working outside the home. What I meant was where I could prioritize my family, I wanted to prioritize them. And so I made a career shift at that point and I took myself off partnership track and I went to work at a different law firm in a kind of hybrid admin legal role that gave me a lot more time control, which is what I felt I needed in order to execute on that priority. And um, I had to call my mom, who, just to refresh your recollection, I just told you went to law school when I was in kindergarten. So in the late 70s, early 80s, at a time where there weren't a lot of women in the law. And so I really felt like she, I mean, I think she is, was a trailblazer for, you know, women in that profession. And here I had to go and tell her, like, I'm taking a step off of this track, off of the trail you blazed for me, and I'm going to put family first. And it felt like, you know, sort of scary to tell her that because we had been through with her career a moment that I talk about in my book where she had made clear that she was putting career first. And so I really was like scared to have this conversation. Like I'm choosing a different priority than you and like, I'm sorry. And her response, which is not surprising in hindsight, but was surprising at the time was, you're just picking what's most important to you. We couldn't be more proud. And so that was like, that was a big aha to me that it's not, it's not what, it's that I am, that I am being true to what matters to me. I could have continued to exist in that space of tension, prioritizing my career and feeling bad about it. I chose not to. And she was proud of me resolving that tension for myself. So, I mean, that's sort of a a weave together of several stories in the book. But, I mean, big, big, important change to how I was living and has really impacted the choices that I have made since that point, almost 16 years ago. I've refined how I would have approach that decision. I mean, I think often about what would it look like to go back and coach that young woman who was sitting on the bathroom floor. And I wonder if, you know, what the path would have looked like. Um, But that said, I mean, everything happens for a reason. And this path has led me to where I am today. And I'm happy to be where I am today doing the work that I'm doing. I also wonder if any of the pandemic or any of the things that have happened over the past two years have shifted the way law firms work in any way. And uh, the expectation for partner track is very high pressure, a lot of hours, and the expectation is that you're working pretty much all the time. So I don't know if that's shifted at all in your view. I think it's shift shifting, right? And, you know, it's been interesting because as I've started to bring, you know, happiness and well-being more broadly back into the law firm space, I just um, spoke with somebody recently who's sort of ahead of me in doing this work and who I admire a lot. And he was pointing out that, you know, lawyers like evidence. All of the evidence suggests that we are working in a way that is like does not have evidence to support it being positive for our well-being. So what are we going to do to resolve that as a profession? And so I'm excited to be able to work in that space. Um, But I think it's true everywhere. Like things are shifting. The world has shifted. We've learned that we have broader capabilities than we thought we could to be flexible 
And people are shifting. People are dialing into this conversation of, wait a minute, this is actually not about a race to a finish line. This is about living each day in a way that is aligned with my priorities. And I think the like Gen Z, millennial, they actually, you know, care a lot more about the things that they care about, you know, the purpose that they have in life or being involved in some kind of community or volunteer things. That's what they care about. And I, I think at, at least for my generation and probably for you, it's we were supposed to work. <laughs> that's what we were supposed to do. And so we did that. And then it was like, OK, well, we'll take care of this family on the side. But it, you know, it just just didn't feel right, you know, and we were trying to figure out how to make it work. And instead, I think there are some choices that are now being put in front of people that are better options and that they have almost been given some permission because everybody's feeling the same thing to do the same thing in a different way. Yeah. And I feel like I grew up in a generation where people were starting to talk about purpose, but then it became this thing of like, if you can't identify your purpose, something is broken about you. Like, you mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that there was this expectation that we would come, maybe not out of college, but that somewhere in our 20s, we'd be able to latch on to the thing. <laughs> and so I have this, com- personally, I have a complicated relationship with purpose because I, I was like, the thing, <laughs> like, what, what is that? I don't, I don't know, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I look at it and say, look, there are certain things about sort of endemic to who we are, character traits that we have, values that we hold that are unlikely to change absent real radical shifts in our lives. And then there's, sort of the things, going back to this notion of seasons, the things that become important at different times in our lives. And so we can hold consistent kind of those values and those character traits, and then we can allow some flexibility around where our focus goes. And that feels a lot better to me because it's not like I'm looking for like the North Star of purpose that somebody's going to put on my tombstone. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Right? I'm I'm actually just looking for like, how am I going to be aligned right now? And it feels less enormous. And and it leaves room for life circumstances to come in and change my my focus. I love that. Yeah, because you're not locked into whatever you've chosen for this moment at this time. Yes. You have the ability to change. Okay. I would love to switch into your transition from working in a high pressure law firm to moving into a world of entrepreneurship and coaching. How was that transition for you? I know it was definitely a challenge for me coming from corporate, but I'm curious how that was for you too. So about six years ago, I decided to leave my law firm job and go and work for a small, um, I will call it entrepreneurial, but it's been around for a decade now, um, investment firm. About a dozen employees now. I think at the time I joined, it was about six, maybe less. And that was a big, that was a big shift. I was like, whoa, this is different, but in a lot of really spectacularly good for me ways. I could have way more impact. We could make decisions more quickly. I wasn't reinventing. I mean, for me, I had been at the same firm for a decade, an amazing firm, an amazing environment. I have nothing but good things to say about my experience there. But when you've been in the same, relatively speaking, the same role for a decade, you're basically cleaning up messes you've made and that's less fun. <laughs> so for yeah, sure. so it was yes. time for something new. So I made that shift and that that just getting out of that bigger sort of more predictable, like what I liked about the big environment or the, the firm environment was the security that it provided and the predictability that provi- that it provided. So letting go of that and moving into this space was sort of the bridge I needed to when it we realized it was time for me to move on from that role to be able to say, maybe I could start my own thing. Maybe I could do something non-traditional. Like, why do I think that it's just about working for a large organization? That's when I decided to go and get a coaching certification and figure out kind of what I could do to really continue to support people. Because the constant, if you look at the through line from sort of, you know, post-college all the way through law school, working as a lawyer, you know, as a law firm administrator and then even working in that investment firm, the, the, the through line is people and process. And so how can I capitalize on playing as much as possible in that space without any of the other noise that goes with doing that in a large organizational context? I love that about you because, um, so Becky and I are in a group outside of this conversation. And so we get to talk um, more often. And I love the way that your brain works, honestly, because you come up with some really 
complex things, but you explain them in the simplest of ways. <laughs> I think that's one of your gifts. <laughs> well, thank you for seeing it. I believe it's one of my gifts too. And it's not something so, you know, speaking of gifts, like one of the things that I talk about with clients is often our gifts are things that don't feel special to us. Mm-hmm. I look at that and I say, well, but I didn't do anything special, right? I just, that's just how my brain is but it is special. And so like, as you think about some of your best gifts that you're using most often, think about the things that people are always telling you, hey, that was awesome how you did that. And you're thinking, what do you mean? Like I just was being myself. Those are the superpowers, my friend. So yeah, but thank you. But thank you for the compliment and thank you for noticing. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely one of your gifts. I love it. Who are the people that you love to coach the so most? So I like to coach people who are super curious, who really want to learn, want to explore, and are willing to go a little bit off the beaten path to find an answer. So people, I mean, I guess that's like a very broad statement, but who I end up coaching, kind of let's put it more in demographic terms, who I end up coaching um, (laughs) on the corporate side is like VP to CEO level. And on the law firm side, it's like, you know, on the verge of partner and partners and then administrators, kind of director and above. And, you know, people who've who've invested some time in their career, people who've done some of their own personal development, some consideration of kind of where they want to go and how they want to get there, but are feeling like, you know, the traditional path, the way that I've been doing it isn't working for me. And I'm now ready to slow down to speed up. And it's important that people come open to the notion that initially when we work together for the first, Mm -hmm. you know, four weeks or so of a 12 week engagement, we're not going to change things circumstantially. We're not going to start looking for that new job. We're not going to, you know, we're going to actually settle where you are and figure out what actually is before we figure out what you need next. And not everyone's willing to do that slowdown and not everyone can. And I understand that, right? Like at some time, we sometimes in our lives need quick change. I'm not in the quick change business. There's a lot of really qualified, amazing coaches who are. That is not me. Um, I am in the um, deeper, longer lasting change business. Mm-hmm. But that's where the real transformation happens, right? If you don't slow, I use the slow down to speed up model as well. And I just find that it's much more impactful to the person and how they show up in the world, how people respond to them if they actually take the time to slow down, which in the fast paced world we're in is a challenge. I totally understand that too. Yes. And, and, and like I said, sometimes it's not time to slow down and it's okay. Like it's, it's, but know that if you want to really sort of like, I think about it, I'm a video game kid. Like I was back in the Nintendo days. (laughs) Right. And I, I think of it as like a turbo charge. Like if you really want to turbo charge your next, your next change, you have to slow down to speed up. Are you finding that you're getting a lot of clients coming to you with more, I will say, post-pandemic related challenges because of everything that happened? I know a lot of people are impacted with stress and anxiety and still feel like, you know, obviously the pandemic is still in existence, um, but is it still something that a lot of people are showing up in your world with? I think what they're, I I don't know if I would call it, I mean, I guess it's post-pandemic. I I think that like the standard way that people are showing up kind of over the last, let's call it six months is it has now become clear that I need to make a change, that what I was doing is not going to work for me long-term, but I don't know what that change is. And like, do I have to get divorced? Do I have to, you know, quit my job and, you know, become a, a floral design artist? Maybe, mm. but, and, and no, no, I mean, like I'm here for that kind of transformation too, clearly, but it's like this notion of like, whoa, can't stay here. Where do I need to go right now? And again, it back to that slow down to speed up nowhere yet. Let's figure out where you are on the inside so we can figure out how to architect whatever the change is. And I would say about half of my clients end up making no radical change to their circumstances And most of their change is about how they're showing up in their circumstances, which then has positive impacts on outcomes in their lives. They maybe get promoted or they are just happier in in the work that they're doing and as they walk through every day. And then the other half do make some sort of job change, circumstance change, but it's they're much more clear on what they're looking for out of that next thing um, in a way that will fuel their continued happiness. 
Yeah, that's amazing. You know, you need to slow down and get some clarity, understand what you want for yourself. And I do believe in the whole ripple effect of you can only change yourself if you want Mm -hmm. to, right? And if you do that, you will start to see how other people respond to you in a different way. And it's understanding how you want to show up in the world that helps you get there. So I know you mentioned kind of briefly that you have a 12-week program. Are there programs that you're doing right now? Are you doing some new ones in the future? Can you share with us what those are like? So I, right now I'm, well, so I'm doing two things right now. One, I'm working with individuals on a one-on-one basis, typically for around 12 weeks, sometimes for longer engagements. And then I'm also working with organizations and that work is more focused on bringing them the sort of science and tools of happiness and well-being. Um, and so that that can be sort of large group presentations or smaller group kind of hybrid um teaching, coaching. So those are the two things that I've got going on now. I do have plans for more, but I'm also moving this summer. And so my plan is actually to survive the move (laughs) and then come back to what, you know, the business looks like. So for now, the ways to work with me are, are kind of in those two buckets as an individual who wants to figure out kind of what next. And as an organization who might want to bring in for a group, some tools to help them do that slow down to speed up exercise of really landing where they are now and getting as, I'll use the word happiness, but I use that broadly, getting as comfortable and happy as they can in their current Mm -hmm. situation. Well, I will definitely share the links for your website and your information. So if anybody is interested in being a part of her programs, I mean, I, I can't say enough great things about Becky. She's a wonderful person. She cares about people and really wants them to be successful in whatever way that means for them. And, and let's, you decide that for yourself to some extent, right? And she's just a guide to help you. (laughs) That's it. That's it. So the next part of our podcast is called Rise Up and Be Visible Quick Tips. And this is something that I ask every guest at the end of their show. And I would love to hear your responses on this because I think they're going to be very different than maybe other people have experienced. So fill in the blank. Visibility is? Being seen for all of you. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, you're all, you're one whole person. I tell people that a lot, right? You're not one person at work. You're a different person at home. You have to be the same person. You just may show up differently. And how can we help you be in kind of, I don't know what the right word is, but in unison between both sides of you, right? Do you have advice or a tip that you could share with the listeners on what you have done to be visible? So one of the things that was really important in my process of priority aligned living that relates to visibility is something in the book that I call priority PR. And what I really mean is being willing to share with people outside of you in all the places what your top priority is for that season. So when I made that transition from Um, practicing lawyer to law firm administrator, I was very clear when I got hired in that new job that family was a priority for me. That clarity created opportunity for me to continue to live in a priority aligned way. If I held that priority but didn't share it with anybody, I wouldn't be positioning myself to have that priority supported by the systems and the people around me. So the tip I would give you is once you have clarity on what matters most to you in this season, don't be shy about telling people what it is. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I think even people who maybe want a different role, but don't tell anybody that they want that role or that they're interested in that role. How are you ever going to be considered for it if no one knows? You know, so there's a lot of ways that you just need to talk about what's important to you or what you care about or what you want. Yeah. And I think what I, I've started to use as like a clue to myself that the conversation needs to happen is the <laughs> the more discomfort I have around having it, the more likely it is that that is a place that I actually need to go and push through the discomfort and have the conversation. Yes, I have that too. I always said that like when I left the craft, you know, I had, I wanted to be sick to my stomach. I was just feeling really awful about leaving, but I knew in my stomach it was the right thing to do. And so I trusted that. And so I think leaning into that fear of the unknown is is an exciting place that you can grow and develop from if you're willing to just push through that little bit of uncomfort that you're going to have. Well, and we have this notion that discomfort is be- like bad and we should avoid it. And I mm-hmm. think you just said it in such a powerful way. Like when we're even when we're going in an aligned direction, it can be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. The discomfort doesn't mean it's wrong. 
Yeah. It just means it's different than what you've been doing. Yeah, I love that. That's so true. What is the one piece of leadership or career advice that you received that helped you the most? I mean, I think we've sort of touched on this already and, and another one's not jumping to mind, but it's it's that advice that I got from my mom through her actions when I was a child and then through that later conversation of how critically important it is to be clear on where you are before you expect, you know, before you engage in sort of mapping out a future with a company, with a person in your life. Um, just really take the time to get mm-hmm. to get clear. And I'll add a second piece of advice. And you said it, you alluded to it already, but when we try to be a different person in different places, that takes a lot of energy. And we live in a world where things move very fast and most of us are mm-hmm. you know, already, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but full. <laughs> and so adding that energy drain <laughs> yes. of sort of splitting your personality, it's exhausting. And I found myself doing that a lot um, early in my career because as a young woman working as an attorney, I mean, I walked into rooms and got mistaken for the court reporter and the secretary and the paralegal on the regular. Mm. And so then it was like, well, how do I need to show up in order to be taken seriously? But the real question was, how do I need to show up as myself in order to be taken seriously? And that myself part was was missing for a minute. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's the hardest part, I think, to not be like everybody else that you see in the room and try to be that person. But to be yourself is I think it's one of the hardest transitions and challenges that everyone can face. But when you get there, I promise all of you listeners, it's such an amazing place to just be yourself every single day and do what you want to do and think about the things that you want to think about. It's just it's it's a great place. It's like the freedom um, that you feel physically when you sat down a heavy backpack you've been carrying. Yes, that's a good way to Really, I mean, it. that's like, that's how it feels to me in my body. It's like, whew, that's a lot. Like, whew, feel so the much lighter. off your shoulders, yes. right? <laughs> okay, last question. What book or books have you read recently that you would recommend? So I thought about this question and then I realized, like, I have not <clears throat> read a book in a minute. Um <laughs> I don't know why you're doing that. And I miss it. So I am actually a voracious reader and I'm super curious and I love to learn. So I will name one of my favorite books that is on my mind a lot recently, which is called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Oh, I love that. Yes, that's a great book. Um, Just um, a reminder that sometimes we think that our our nervous system or, or our past programming or patterning creeps up when things are going wrong. But the premise of this book is that it also creeps up when things are going right in new and expansive ways. And um, that's a real thing. So it's been on my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that book. I need to reread that, actually, because it just every time you reread these books, sometimes you think, oh, I've already read it. But you, you pick up some new nuggets that you haven't thought about for a while and it makes you see it differently because time has passed, too. You yes. have changed and now what you're reading changes. So I love this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. How would you like people to connect with you if they'd like to reach out to you? So I try to be one-stop shopping on my website, which is (laughs) untanglehappiness.com. Again, untangle, no D, untanglehappiness.com. And you can find my book there. You can learn about the work that I do. You can um, find all of my social links to connect with me. And I would love to hear from you if there's something we talked about here that piqued your interest or you have questions. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. Love that. Very, and keeping it simple. See, this is what she does so well. (laughs) Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Becky. And for all of the listeners, I hope you picked up some really good nuggets today in this conversation that you can apply for your leadership or in your personal lives or professional lives. I love the conversation that we had and pick up her book, The Happiness Recipe. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Thanks for joining today on The Visibility Factor. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks so much for listening to the Visibility Factor podcast. Remember that visibility starts with small steps that are intentional and consistent each day. Be bold, be visible, be the leader you were meant to be. Find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Follow us on all of our social media platforms, which are highlighted in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Visibility Factor podcast.